the friend of sinners. Let's magnify his name together in the words of Psalm 145, Psalm 145, in the second version of the psalm. O Lord, thou art my God and King, thee will I magnify and praise. I will be blessed and gladly sing unto thy holy name always. Psalm 145, singing verses 1 to 8. If you're able to stand for this singing, please do so and will remain standing afterward as we call on the Lord in prayer. Psalm 145. Our God and our Father, as we come into your presence this evening, we thank you and we bless you for the reminder that we have been given in the words of this psalm, that you are a God who is great and a God who is glorious, that you are the one who is both God and King. You are the God whose works are indeed wondrous and mighty. You are the God who is to be praised in the morning and worshipped in the evening. And we praise and bless you this evening that we are given this opportunity to come before this great, glorious God who is unchanging, who is the same yesterday, today and forever. That when we read about all the great works of power that you did in the Old and the New Testaments, we thank you that we are reminded in your word that you are the God who doesn't change, that your arm hasn't grown short, that your hand is as powerful as it ever was. And we praise and bless you not only for the reminder of your greatness and glory, but also for the reminder of your goodness and grace. That in this psalm, we find the psalm is speaking of the fact that you are a God who is uh, merciful and gracious, plenteous in your compassion. And we thank you and bless you that we are given that great declaration of your grace again and again in the pages of your word. That we read in the book of Exodus how your people rebelled against you and how they created and formed a golden calf and worshipped it. You had every right and reason to 
liquidate them and extinguish them from the face of the earth. And yet you told Moses that you were the God who is merciful and gracious and that you would preserve a remnant of them, that you wouldn't wipe them out. And we thank you and bless you that in the life of David, we find him again sinning against you in thought and word and indeed a man whose hands were described as being so covered in blood that he was forbidden from building a temple for you. And yet he was also able to sing in his life about your mercy and grace to him. The fact that you didn't treat him the way that his sins ultimately deserved, that you are the God who preserved him and gave him promises for the future. We thank you that we see this also in the life of Jonah and how Jonah is there preaching to the people of Nineveh and how he spoke to them about the sin of that city that had come before your throne, come before your face. And yet, O oh Lord, you are the God who preserved that city because you were the God who is merciful and gracious. You relented from sending the disaster that had been threatened against it. And we thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the fullest display of your mercy and grace that we read in your word that from him uh, we receive grace added to grace. We come into your presence this evening acknowledging our need of your grace. We come before you tonight acknowledging that we are those who sin against you in thought and sin against you in word and sin against you in deed that there are things that we allow our minds to focus on that we shouldn't be allowing our minds to focus on and we find ourselves failing to think upon the things that you encourage us in your word to think on, the things uh, that are in heaven. We are those who often say things that we shouldn't be saying and we fail to be saying the things that we should be saying. We engage in acts and activities that we have no business engaging in and we fail to do the things that you call us to do in your word. We are those who rebel against you and we are those who when we're not rebelling or falling short. Yet we praise and bless you for the abundance of your grace and mercy in Jesus, and that in him we are told that there is one who removes our sin as far as east is from the west, takes all our condemnation away, and that we can stand in him tonight. We thank you and bless you that through Christ we can call you our Father, and that through Christ we know that we have hope, not only for today, but hope for the future, a hope that not even get death can destroy or ex extinguish. And we pray that this evening you would enable us from the youngest to the oldest to worship you in spirit and in truth. Please create in us a desire to worship you. So often we find ourselves consumed with things that have gone on over the past week. And maybe we find our hearts a little bit cold, a little insensitive to the things of your word. But we pray, O oh Lord, that you would whet our spiritual appetite tonight and that we would magnify and bless your name as a corporate collective congregation of your redeemed people. And we pray that we would look back in days to come and be able to say how good it was for us to be here. For here we met with our God, were ministered to by our God. And that it was even an opportunity for us to minister to one another, that we would seek to bear one another's burdens and be there for one another. So bless us and presence yourself among us now as we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, it's really good to see uh, the younger ones who are here tonight. I wonder, do any of you have rules in your houses. Do any of you have house rules? We have, I'm going to get into a lot of trouble this evening, we have quite a few house rules in our house. I'm not the one that's come up with these rules. My better half has come up with these rules, it seems. And one of the rules is remember to recycle. I used to just throw everything into just the one bin uh, and Natalie says, remember to recycle, remember to put things into the blue bin, into the green bin, into the brown bin, into the gray bin. So that's one rule to remember, the recycling rule. Uh, another rule is not to leave my clothes lying in the middle of the bathroom floor. Uh, I, I would often just say, have my shower and leave my 
pajamas or whatever in the bathroom floor and I would go off and get on with the day and and I would know that there was only really one person in the whole town who you know two people who used my bathroom in the whole town and that's Chris and Myrtle Campbell I thought they won't mind seeing my clothes lying in the bathroom floor but uh but Natalie said don't leave your clothes lying in the bathroom floor uh another one is related to the bathroom as well I really hope I'm not going to get in trouble for this but it's Put the toilet seat down after you've left the toilet. You know, I would just leave the toilet seat up or down or whatever, but she always says, leave it down. It's not polite to be leaving a toilet seat just lying up like that when you've flushed it. Uh, another one is don't stockpile pasta and pasta sauces. As some of you know, especially those of you in youth fellowship, I, I like to make sure that any... Uh, You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful in case there's a pandemic or a rainy day or the ferry doesn't sail. So I would have lots and lots of pasta in the shelves. Uh, and it's great to stockpile. And, and Natalie said, don't stockpile. You don't need six things of linguine and six things of fusilli and 20 jars of dolmio and all these other things. And the final rule that I have, there may be a few other rules, but I won't go into any of them. But the other rule is don't set your alarm for half past six in the morning. She hates hearing my alarm going off at that time of day. And especially on a Saturday morning when I'm hopping out of bed and she does not want to be woken up by that alarm in the morning. So she says, don't set your alarm for 6.30 in the morning. And you know what? I keep all these rules. I keep all these rules, and it's not because Natalie's a horrible ogre. You all know that she's not a horrible ogre. Uh, I keep these rules because I love her, because she's a very, very, maybe, well, I shouldn't say maybe, she is the most special person in my life to me. So I keep these rules because I know that it, it keeps Natalie happy, and I want to show her that I love her, that I care about her. And she's probably going to be thinking, well, actually, you did leave your socks in the bathroom a few days ago. But I do my best to keep these different rules to show that I love her. And, you know, in the Bible, God gives us rules. He gives us his laws. And we keep these rules that he gives us, these laws that he gives us, not because he's horrible and he's a nasty ogre, but because we love him and we want to show that we love him. And that's what we're going to be thinking about this evening. The way that Jesus speaks about how his people are to follow his rules, follow the commands of God, not because God's horrible and scary, but because we love him and we want our lives to show that we love him. So there's a question for you younger ones to ask yourselves this evening. Does my life show that I love Jesus? Does my life show that I love God? So we'll think about this in a short while, but we're going to sing again. This time in the words of the hymn, Before the Throne of God Above. This great hymn that reminds us of our great confidence, our great assurance as the Lord's people. If you're able to stand for this singing, please do so, Before the Throne of God Above. Thank you. 
Well, a reading from the Word of God is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Uh, Matthew, chapter 5, and reading verses 17 down to 20. Matthew, chapter 5, uh, from verse uh, 17. For Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. This is the word of God to us this evening. And we'll again sing this time in the words of the hymn, Rock of Ages. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And if you're able to stand for this singing again, eh, please do so. As we prepare our minds and hearts to focus on the word of God together, let's again pray. Let's draw near to him. Our Father in heaven, we thank you and we bless you this evening for your word. And we thank you and bless you, O Lord, that you are the God who speaks into that word. That when those words were first written all those thousands of years ago, you inspired those writers. And we read in your word that those men of old spoke, they were almost, as it were, ferried along by your Holy Spirit as they recorded these glorious truths. But thank you that you do not simply speak into your word, but we are also assured that just as you have spoken into your word, so you continue to speak out of your word, that your spirit 
takes these written words and applies them with force and power and precision to minds and hearts and eternal souls. That's our prayer this evening, that as we focus on your word together, your spirit would speak to each and every one of us. You know everyone who's in this building tonight, some who may be walking closely with you, others who may be drifting from you, and others who may never have begun yet to walk with you. But we pray, O Lord, that as we focus on your word now, we would hear you addressing us in our situation and in our own contexts, and that you would arrest us and draw us nearer to yourself, that those who know you, those who love you, would find their knowledge of you increasing, their love for you deepening, their affection for you multiplying. And for those who may be here tonight who may not yet have called themselves followers of Jesus, that even this evening you would say something to them through the pages of your word that might draw them to yourself. You tell us in your word that your law is perfect and it can convert the soul in sin. And we pray, O Lord, that you would indeed do a work of conversion this evening. And not only a work of conversion, but also a work of consoling. Because we acknowledge that we are dealing with hard things that Jesus said. Words and truths that could easily be misinterpreted and misunderstood. But we pray, O Lord, that as we focus on these words, (coughs) our whole focus would be set on this Jesus and that he would be our consolation and that he would be our comfort in life and in death. We thank you and bless you for the words that we have sung together, words that remind us that when Satan tempts us to despair and tells us of the guilt within, we can look up and see Jesus there who has made an end of all our sin. We thank you that we are reminded in the words that we have just sung that it's not the labor of our hands that can fulfill thy law's demands, that we could come before you with streams of tears flowing, but our only hope ultimately is Christ. And we pray that that would be true of each and every one of us this evening, that we would be able to say that he is indeed our only hope. So bless us as we spend this time in your word now and please put away all distraction and all discouragement and all disturbance as we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, friends, would you turn with me please to the words that we read in uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 17 to 20, we'll read them again. For Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law till all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In allness, our family dentist used to give a small appointment card to mum after each visit, telling us when our next trip would be. And mum would dutifully stick that small appointment card up on one of the shelves in the kitchen, and she would then write the date of the appointment in the calendar. Uh, And every morning as I went to feed our pet guinea pig in the kitchen, I would see that appointment card and I would see the dreaded date of that dentist appointment drawing nearer and nearer and nearer. And I felt a bit like that when I came to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. When I planned out this series a few months ago, this series on this unforgettable sermon, I knew that I would have to eventually deal with these difficult verses where Jesus speaks about the unpopular subject of God's law. And so like a sticking plaster, we're not going to try and 
slowly peel back what Jesus says. Instead, we're going to rip the plaster off and dive straight in. We're looking at these verses under two headings, the consummation and then the commendation. The consummation and the commendation. First, the consummation. Look at verses 17 and 18, where Jesus speaks about himself as being the consummation of God's law. We can begin by noting the context. Jesus is preaching this sermon to a congregation of his disciples, men and women who have committed themselves to him. They have gathered around him on this mountain, and he has sat down and began to teach them like any other rabbi or religious leader. And he had started this sermon by giving a description of the citizens of his kingdom, those who are under the saving reign of God, verses 3 to 12. He spoke about their condition. The citizens of his kingdom are poor in spirit. They admit their spiritual bankruptcy. The citizens of his kingdom are those who mourn. They lament over their own sin, but not only their own sin, but also the sin of others. The citizens of his kingdom are those who are meek. They don't push themselves forward. They don't engage in self-promotion. The citizens of his kingdom hunger and thirst after righteousness. They long to be in a right standing with God. They long to do what is right in the sight of God. And they long for God to eventually put everything right. He had then spoken about their conduct. The citizens of his kingdom are merciful. They show compassion to those who have hurt them, those who have harmed them. The citizens of his kingdom are pure in heart. They pursue after God with their whole innermost being. And the citizens of his kingdom are peacemakers. They seek to reconcile those who become estranged from one another. If they see that Spangy and Eleanor aren't speaking to one another, they seek to draw them together and get them to speak together. If they see that Butch and I haven't spoken to each other for a while, they try and draw us together, get us speaking together. And Jesus goes on and he speaks about their conflict. He says that the citizens of his kingdom are persecuted for righteousness sake. And not only are they persecuted for righteousness sake, but they are reviled, they are persecuted, they are falsely spoken about on account of him. And he then spoke about the influence of the citizens of his kingdom. Verses 13 to 16. He said that they were salt in a decaying world. He said that they were light in a dark world. In other words, they are a distinctive people. And as a distinctive people, they make a difference. We can then move from the context to the concern that Jesus addresses at the beginning of verse 17. The opening words of Jesus' sermon have been startling. And what's startling isn't so much what Jesus has said as what he has not said. He has been speaking about the kingdom of God, but he has said nothing about the law of God. And that would have been troubling to those who were listening to him, who knew how important the law of God was, not only from their scriptures, but from what they heard in the synagogue week by week. And so Jesus seeks to alleviate and address their concerns. And he begins by saying that he has come. That is a significant expression. It shows that Jesus is deeply conscious that he has come. He has come into the world with a particular mission in mind. And he continues by saying that he has not come to abolish the law or the prophets. The phrase the law and the prophets refers to the Old Testament scriptures, all God's written revelation up to this point. And Jesus is telling his hearers that he has not come to abolish that law, not come to dismantle and pick apart that law or the prophets. And having addressed this concern, Jesus speaks about his commitment to the law in verses 17 and 18. He speaks about the consummation of the law. Look at verse 17. He emphasizes once again that he has not come to abolish the law or the prophets. Instead, he has come to fulfill them. The word fulfill is interesting. It means to complete something, to consummate something, to, to bring something to its full realization. As many of you know, I love the Lord of the Rings films. But it's impossible to watch just one of these films and not bother with the other two, even if it's going to take another six to eight hours. You need the other two films to complete the story, consummate the story, bring the story to its full realization. 
And that is the point that Jesus is making here. He is saying that the Old Testament scriptures find their completion, they find their consummation, they find their full realization in him. The Old Testament is incomplete without him. Jesus is claiming here, friends, to be the one who has come to fulfill the prophets. That's straightforward enough. The Old Testament prophets spoke often about days of restoration, days of blessing. And they said that these days of restoration, these days of blessing would be realized, would be accomplished through God's chosen deliverer, God's chosen savior, the the messianic king. And Jesus is saying here, I'm the one in whom these prophecies find their fulfillment. I'm the one in whom these prophecies find their accomplishment. I have come to fulfill the prophets. But he is also claiming to be the one who's come to fulfill the law. He has come to fulfill the law that God gave to Moses through his own perfect and unparalleled obedience to its commands. He has come to fulfill the law that God gave to Moses through his teaching and explanation about all its demands. And he has come to fulfill the law that God gave to Moses as he becomes the supreme sacrifice that every other sacrifice pointed toward. Quite simply, the law, as well as the prophets, find their fulfillment, they find their completion, they find their consummation in Jesus. But Jesus isn't finished because he goes on to speak about the continuation of that law. Look at verse 18. He begins with the words, Truly I say to you, that is the first time that Jesus uses this expression in Matthew's gospel. As we read the gospels, we see that Jesus uses this expression again and again to emphasize that what he is saying is important and must be carefully listened to. And he says here that not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law. Now this Greek word iota refers to the Hebrew letter Yod. It was the tiniest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The dot that Jesus speaks about was a tiny brush stroke that was used to differentiate the different letters in that alphabet. Jesus is saying here, I have not come to abolish, do away with the tiniest parts of the Old Testament law not the smallest letter, and not the smallest part of the letter. And he emphasizes this by saying that not an iota or a dot will pass from it until heaven and earth pass away and all has been accomplished, all has been fulfilled. It would be bordering on the impossible to make a more emphatic statement concerning the continuation of God's law. Jesus is saying here, I've not come to do away with the law. I've come to see it brought to its full realization. Now, friends, as we consider these verses, we are being reminded that Jesus is the great subject of the Old Testament. Jesus is the great subject of the Old Testament. That's what we see in Matthew 5. Jesus says that he has not come to abolish. He has not come to pick apart and dismantle the law or the prophets, God's written revelation, the Old Testament scriptures. Instead, he says he has come to fulfill them, bring them to their intended completion, their intended consummation, their full realization. Jesus is saying here that the Old Testament in general and the law in particular is about him. It points to him. It finds its fulfillment in him. And that's such an important reminder for us this evening. There's an apocryphal story about an Australian Sunday school teacher who was speaking to her class one day. uh, And she said to them, "Uh, what's gray and furry and eats eucalyptus leaves? And the class just looked amused and said nothing. And so she pressed him a little further and said, come on, guys, you know what it is. It's gray, it's furry, it eats eucalyptus leaves. It, 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 you see it running about in the wild. It, it even It's a kind of bear. What am, what am I talking about? And after an awkward silence, one little girl put up her hand and said, please, miss, 
I know the answer is Jesus, but it sounds an awful lot like a koala bear. Now, it's a very humorous story, but it illustrates the point that wherever we might find ourselves in the Old Testament, wherever we might find ourselves in the Bible, we ought to get round to speaking about Jesus. He is the great subject of the Old Testament as well as the great subject of the New Testament. In his book on preaching, Tim Keller writes, each part of the Bible points to Christ in its particular way. He is the hope of the patriarchs. He is the angel of the Lord. He is the fulfiller of the law. He is the final temple. He is the commander of the Lord's host. He is the true king of Israel and the true Israel. Look at the Psalms in which Jesus is the sweet singer of Israel. Then go to the prophets and there he's the promised king, the suffering servant, <coughs> the world healer. Go to the Proverbs and you find that he is the true wisdom of God. Each genre and part of the Old Testament looks toward Christ. The Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle wrote these words over a hundred years earlier. He says, Christ is the sum and substance of the Old Testament. The further we read in the volume of the Old Testament, the clearer do we find the testimony about Christ. The light which the inspired writers enjoyed in ancient days was at best but dim compared to that of the true gospel. But the coming person they all saw afar off and on whom they all fixed their eyes was one and the same. Friends, tonight we are being reminded from the lips of Jesus himself that he is the great subject of the Old Testament. He is on every page. And if I ever get up and preach a sermon on the Old Testament and I don't mention Jesus somewhere, you have my full permission to report me to the presbytery and get rid of me as your minister. Friend, if you are reading the Old Testament, look for how it points to Jesus. And can I encourage those of you who are parents that when you're doing family worship in your homes, that as you go through the Old Testament, you point your children to how Jesus is on every page of that Old Testament. There's, there's a lovely children's Bible called uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible. And, and get it for your children. Let them see how Jesus is the great subject of the Old Testament. But as we consider these verses, we're also being reminded that Jesus isn't simply the great subject of the Old Testament. He is the great saviour who is presented in the New Testament. That's what we see in Matthew 5. Jesus says that he has come to abolish. He's not come to abolish. He's not come to pick apart and dismantle the law, the prophets, God's written revelation, the Old Testament scriptures. Instead, he says that he has come to fulfill them, bring them to their intended completion, their intended consummation, their, their full realization. Jesus is saying that, all the sacrifices in the Old Testament and all the promises, the prophecies of salvation in the Old Testament find their fulfillment in him. My old professor at the Free Church College, John L. Mackay, writes, by offering himself as a sacrifice for sin, Jesus superseded the Levitical priests of the Mosaic dispensation and also once for all presented the final sacrifice that obtained eternal redemption, thus bringing the worship of the temple to an end. It was not that these regulations were annulled, but consummated. What they had foreshadowed had now arrived. And friends, that is so important for us to remember this evening. Jesus is the great saviour who is presented in the New Testament. In fulfilling the law and the prophets, he has secured a full and free salvation package for all his people. A salvation that includes forgiveness of sin. A salvation that includes entrance into God's kingdom. A salvation that includes adoption into God's family. A salvation that includes a glorious future inheritance with all the saints. And friends, all we are required to do is rest on him. 
this great Savior who is presented in the New Testament. All we are required to do is receive that full and free salvation package that he offers. Can I, can I ask you to imagine that this was a box filled with that salvation package that Jesus has secured at great cost to himself. And he simply says, receive this. Receive this full, free salvation from me. And as such, we can sing with the hymn writer, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Let me ask you this evening, friend. Do you see Jesus as the great saviour who is presented in the New Testament? And do you see him as your saviour who has lived and died fulfilling the law and the prophets for you? Don't think to yourself that he fulfilled the law and the prophets for Spangy. Sorry, picking you against Spangy. Don't think that he has come to fulfill the law and the prophets for myself. Don't think has he come to fulfill the law and the prophets for anybody else in this room. I ask you the question, friend, can you say that he has come to fulfill the law and the prophets for you? That he has come to secure that full and free salvation package for you? If not, friend, then, then you are still outside of his kingdom. So there's the consummation, but then we come to the commendation. Look at verses 19 and 20. Where Jesus now commends the keeping of God's law to his disciples. And he begins by speaking about relaxation. Look at verse 19. He draws his hearers' attention to those who relax the least of these commands. Beginning of verse 19. It's important that we remember that the Old Testament consisted of ceremonial laws. Laws that revolved around the whole sacrificial system. But it also consisted of moral laws that revolved around God's ethical requirements and commands. And it's this moral law that Jesus is now thinking about as he speaks here about these commandments. And he says that there may be some who try to relax, loosen, bend, break these commandments. But they don't simply relax these commandments themselves. They also teach others to do the same. A few years ago, there was an American preacher, Tullian Chivijan. He's actually a grandson of the famous evangelist, Billy Graham. And this man, Tullian Chivijan, was living a morally compromised life where he was having numerous secret affairs while also a pastor in a large American church. Now, his relaxation of God's commands in his own life was a very serious matter. But what was even more serious was that it resulted in him preaching what we might call a hyper-grace message from the pulpit, where he was saying that obedience to the commands of God isn't that important. And that is the problem that Jesus is highlighting here where he speaks about people, yes, who relax the commandments of God in their own lives, but also teach and encourage others to do the same. And Jesus says here that such people will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. In his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, Jonathan Pennington writes, being least in the kingdom of heaven isn't a reference to ranking in the kingdom or getting into the kingdom by the skin of one's teeth, but rather it's a way of saying that one does not get in at all. And Jesus then speaks about those who refuse to relax these commandments. Look again at verse 19. He speaks about those who do these commandments and they don't simply keep these commandments for themselves. They also encourage and teach others to do the same. And Jesus says here that they will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus then moves from speaking about relaxation to speaking about righteousness. Look at verse 20. He begins with the words, I tell you. 
Once again, this refers to a very solemn statement that Jesus is making, that he wants people to listen to what he's saying and to put it into practice, to, to really take it on board. And Jesus says here that the righteousness of his disciples, the righteousness of the citizens of his kingdom, must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, righteousness simply means doing what is right in the sight of God. And the scribes and the Pharisees were experts when it came to practicing an outward righteousness. The, the scribes studied God's law and, and how it applied to their lives. The Pharisees were meticulous keepers of God's law. In fact, they didn't just keep those laws. They also wrote about another 200 or 300 laws in addition to this just to safeguard themselves from breaking any of God's laws. In Jesus' day, it was commonly said that if only two people were to be admitted into heaven, one would be a scribe, the other a Pharisee. And now Jesus says that the righteousness of his disciples must exceed, it must surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. And, and he goes further. And he says that unless the righteousness of his disciples exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, they will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That is a shocking statement. Since the Pharisees and the scribes were the religious elite, the religious untouchables of Jesus' day. They were on a higher plane. They were on a higher spiritual level. And Jesus is saying here that his disciples need to surpass them in terms of righteousness. What's Jesus getting at? What's Jesus driving at? Well, Sinclair Ferguson, who is always a trusted source to go to, writes this. The verses that follow illustrate what Jesus meant. Pharisaic righteousness was outward, skin deep. Christian righteousness is to be internal, real. It is to be heart conformity to the law of God. Our obedience to the law is not to be merely external but real, internal, spiritual. This is the practical fulfillment of the law that marks out Jesus' disciples. And so the stage is now set for looking at verses 21 to 48 over the coming weeks, where Jesus will speak about righteousness when it comes to anger, lust, oaths, retaliation, and love for one's enemies. Friends, as we consider these verses, we are being reminded about how seriously a disciple of Jesus, a citizen of the kingdom, should take God's law. That's what we see in Matthew 5. Jesus says that those who relax the least of these commandments and teach others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. He then says that those who do these commandments and teach others to do the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And he sums it all up by saying that the righteousness of his disciples, the righteousness of the citizens of his kingdom must exceed, it must surpass the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, that it's to be internal rather than simply external. And that is so important for us to remember this evening. I'm going to say something that's not popular, but I've given up trying to be popular now. I think 11 years in the ministry, you realize you're never going to be popular. But what I'm going to say isn't popular. And it's not popular even in some Christian circles. But it's biblical. True disciples of Jesus True citizens of the kingdom take God's moral law, they take his commandments seriously. I'll say it again. True disciples of Jesus, true citizens of the kingdom take God's moral law, they take his commandments seriously. 
John L. Mackay makes that point in his booklet, The Moral Law, where he writes, the gospel records show conclusively that Jesus regarded the Old Testament as the inspired word of God and the law as the divinely given rule of life. Those who disparage God's moral law should remember that Christ lived perfectly in accordance with it. Those who would truly be his disciples must recognize and adopt the standards by which he lived. Now, friends, please hear me clearly. I am not saying that we are forgiven by keeping God's commandments. I am not saying that we are adopted into God's family by keeping his commandments. I am not saying that we are admitted into God's kingdom by our keeping of his commandments. I am not saying that we are brought into God's heaven by our keeping of his commandments. I've spent the last 17 years preaching that we are saved by Jesus and Jesus alone, that it's all about grace. And when I come to leave this world, I hope that the last word on my lips will not be high free church. Goodness, I'll be in a bad way if that's the last thing I'm saying as I prepare to leave this world. And I hope that the last word on my lips will not be you too. And I hope that the last word on my lips will not even be Natalie. Sad though she might find that. I hope rather that the last word that will be found on my lips as I prepare to leave this world will be Jesus. And when I come to stand before God's throne and he asks me the question, why should I let you into my heaven? What qualifies you for entrance into this glorious inheritance? I will not be up there saying, well, I was a faithful pastor in the high free and I kept your laws perfectly and and I was really a cut above the rest. And you know, I'm not a cut above the rest, but rather I will be saying my only hope is Jesus. That is what I'll be saying. So I am not saying for one minute, friends, that we are saved by our keeping of God's commandments. But none of that means that you or I shouldn't take God's moral law, shouldn't take his commandments seriously. Sinclair Ferguson writes, Jesus is saying that our attitude to the law of God is an index of our attitude to God himself. The law isn't the basis on which we merit salvation, but it provides a test to distinguish between those who belong to the kingdom and those who are outside of it. It is the real test of whether we are born again or not. And so as we close, let me ask you, how seriously Are you taking God's moral law? How seriously are you taking his commandments, especially the Ten Commandments that he has given? As you look at your life this evening, friend, can you see a life that has been shaped by an attitude that loves the Lord and wants to obey his commands? Or do you see a life that finds this God to be bothersome? And his commands a bit of a burden. Do you find the kingdom calling of living for God's glory a great joy? Or do you find it a grim chore? Friend, can I ask you this evening, is your heart, is your attitude to God's law giving evidence that you are born again and that you are a citizen now of his kingdom or that you might still be spiritually dead and belong elsewhere. Friends, when we think about this law, we are not to hear Jesus saying, this law is what you must do in order to be saved. When we think about this law, we are hearing Jesus saying, this law is an indicator, it is an index, it is a mark as to whether or not you are saved. And we need to get that balance right.
Well, let's close by singing the words of the hymn of Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verses 7 down to 11. Psalm 19, verses 7 to 11, which reminds us of the, the beauty of God's law and the use of that law. God's law is perfect and converts the soul in sin that lies. God's testimony is more sure and makes the simple wise. Psalm 19, verses 7 down to 11. And if you're able to stand for this singing, please do so. heaven, we have considered truths from your word this evening that could so easily become distorted. And so we pray that your spirit would take the words that we have considered tonight and apply them in a proper and appropriate way to our minds and our hearts and our souls, that we would go away from this place knowing that Jesus is the great subject of the Old Testament, that he is on its every page and that he is the great saviour who is presented in the New Testament, who has secured a full and free salvation package for all his people through his fulfilling the law and the prophets. And may we be those, O oh Lord, who take that law seriously, even the moral commands that you give in your word not so that we would be trying to earn or merit your favor and salvation, but because we are reminded in your word that the citizens of your kingdom, the disciples of Jesus, are those who love him and keep his commands. <laughs> 
We pray, O Lord, that none of us would leave this place tonight despairing or discouraged, but that we might leave this place with our attention and gaze fixed evermore on Jesus, in whose name we pray these things. Amen.